Oh, hello, 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 my friends. Scotty J here, back again with another episode of 999. Now, last time we were abducted, it would seem, brought to a strange room, we're locked in, we managed to escape that room, and as we've entered this grand foray here, we have run into another group of people. Uh, so, last time we asked who were these people, today, let's see if we can find out, shall we? Who were these people? This entire interaction lasted only a matter of seconds. The woman spoke to Junbei and time began to move again. I guess there's another one of us now. The woman was dressed, Junbei thought, rather like a dancer. Her clothes covered very little and her prodigious, prodigious, prodigious jewelry, little more. Hey, you, come on, hurry. With no further ceremony, she ran straight past Junpei and toward the door behind him. The sudden proximity of a woman with such striking assets let Jun left Junpei momentarily stunned. But the others wasted no time and quickly followed the strange woman. The first to pass Junpei was a young man with silver hair. He threw a quick glance in Junpei's direction as he ran, muttering, Huh, another one of us, huh? Following him was an older man, his face calm and without fear. Soft wrinkles sprouted from his eyes, and he came close enough as he passed for Junpei to see wisps of gray in his hair. His composure and shock of hair struck Junpei <clears throat> as rather like an elderly lion. <clears throat> Going up won't do you any good. There are two doors. Neither of them will open. The next to speak was a girl with pink hair and a high voice. Come on! Aren't you coming? We gotta hurry! Her small hand was wrapped around the wrist of another man. His eyes were closed, almost as though he were sleeping. His features were graceful, almost serene. And he was dressed rather elegantly for someone his age. Something about his posture seemed very refined, and Jupe couldn't help but feel he was noble and dignified somehow. He'd certainly never seen one, but this man seemed like Junpei, what he'd always imagined a prince would be like. That's nine of us, then. All of the cards are in hand. What does all of the cards in hand mean, he wondered. Junpei opened his mouth to ask what the other man had meant, but the girl in pink hair rushed past him and they were gone. He turned just in time to see two more people running towards him. One of them had hair like a bird's nest and looked as though a stiff breeze might topple him. And the other was a verifiable mountain of a man. The scrawny one said nothing and scuttled past Junpei as though he were running from something. Hey, what the hell are you just standing there for? Didn't you hear him? Uh huh. The doors on A deck are no good. We gotta check the doors on B deck. Got it? Now go. Before he had a chance to respond, the man laid a massive hand on Junpei's shoulder. With no more effort than Junpei used to brush aside a fly, the man shoved him out of the way. Whoa! Thrown off balance by the man and the recent events, it took Junpei a few steps to get his bearings. He finally regained his balance and look up, looked up at what the other seven men had been running from. There were two pairs of large iron doors set into the wall in front of him. They looked quite sturdy, and each had handles jutting from them. Written across the surface of each door in red paint was a number. The door on the right had a four and the door on the left had a five. They're the same. The guy Junpei decided to call Silver was mumbling to himself. The room I woke up in had, the, had a number on a door just like that. You too, eh? With an arched eyebrow, the lion looked over at Silver. My cell was the same, a number upon the door. I opened it, ran down the hallway outside, and found myself in a rather grand room, full of stairs, as I expect did the rest of you. It was as though the floodgates had opened. They all began to talk at once. Me too. I did too. Yeah, a door with a number on it. It soon became clear that each one of them had awoken in a room with a locked door and solved the puzzle to escape. They'd all ended up in the same room. Almost as though they'd been guided there. Yes, we all saw the same thing. That's not important. We need to hurry. Yeah, you think I don't know that lady? Before the dancer had time to finish, Silver was already running. 
He grabbed hold of the door labeled five and pulled. However, fuck, it's not opening. Ah, uh, this damn thing won't even budge. Move. You're in the way. The mountain grabbed Silver's shoulder and tossed him aside. His path cleared, he took a few steps back and then threw himself at the door. Once, twice, three times, four times? The door shook as his body slammed against it, but showed no signs of breaking or opening. The mountain threw himself at the door again. Junpei turned towards door four. Next to the door on the wall was a small box. It looked just like the one he'd seen in his room next to that door. If it was the same, then this door was likely locked as well. Still, he had to check. Junpei grabbed the handle and threw all of his weight onto it. Gah! It was locked as tight as the door next to it, as he suspected. Damn it! Junpei punched the door and it did not respond. Doors cannot talk, you see. Were these the only doors, he wondered? He'd barely finished the thought when the sea deck plate he'd passed on his way up sprang, unbidden to his mind. His body moved before he had time to think. Jupe turned and ran back towards the stairs. He had scarcely taken a step when, at the top of the stairs, next to an ornate clock embedded in the wall, he saw a person. It was a girl. She looked to be about the same age as Junpei. He froze, unable to look away from her face. He wasn't confounded by her beauty or something equally as silly. No, there was another reason he couldn't take his eyes off the girl. Junpei had seen her somewhere before. He couldn't quite remember where, but he knew. He knew he'd met her before. That girl, too, stared at Junpei, similarly stunned. Her response suggested she'd seen him before as well. <sighs> hmm. Without saying a word, Junpei walked slowly towards her. She didn't move. It was almost as though she was held in place by some sort of magic spell. As Junpei stepped onto her landing, the spell broke. No sooner had he set his foot down than the whole ship shook a second time. Ah! The quake caught the girl unprepared and she fell. Moving on instinct, Junpei leapt to catch her. Or so he thought. Her face was far closer than it should have been, mere inches from his own. He was flat on his back and she had landed squarely on top of him. The girl seemed as confused as he did and her face suggested she still didn't fully recover from seeing him. For a moment, that seemed to stretch for a very, very long time, they stared at one another. The ship stopped shaking. Everything was quiet. Water could be heard from the bottom of the ship, lapping faintly at the walls and ceiling, but eventually that faded as well. The silence was complete, a thick, muffling blanket. At last, the girl opened her mouth. Oh my gosh, is that you, Jumpy? Jumpy, Jumpy. Her words echoed through Junpei's head and suddenly his memory returned. Uh, Akane? Why hadn't he realized it before? The girl was Akane Kurashiki. She and Junpei had been friends in childhood. They'd gone to elementary school together for six years. But what was she doing on the ship? Her soft eyes were only inches away from his own. He could feel the warmth of her face. Feelings he'd thought long forgotten began to work their way to the surface. He could feel his face heating up. At that moment, a speaker crackled to life, and a cold, eerie voice filled the room. Welcome aboard. I welcome you all, from the bottom of my heart, to this, my vessel. With the voice's invasion, the spell between Junpei and Akane was broken and all hints of a budgeting romance instantly forgotten. They hurriedly untangled themselves from one another and struggled to their feet. Their seven companions had heard the voice as well, and many of their faces had gone pale. They looked around frantically, desperate to locate the source of the voice. At last, they found it. A speaker set in the ceiling. I am Zero, the captain of this ship. I am also the person who invited you here. The voice was harsh, obscured occasionally by the crackle static. But Junpei recognized it. How could he have forgotten it? It was the same voice he'd heard from the man in the gas mask. Hey, asshole, what the hell? 
Come on out here. I want to get a good look at you. <laughs> what do you mean to do to us? I mean to have you participate in a game. Some of you I know are familiar with this game. The Nonary Game. It is a game where you will put your life on the line. Notary game? The hell's that? The voice continued, implacidly. Implacidly. The rules of the notary game can be found upon your persons. They are simple rules. Read them. Notary game? Hey, there's something in my pocket. Check this out. Silver reached into his pocket and pulled out a small slip of paper. The rest of them reached into their own pockets and pulled out similar slips of paper. Junpei followed suit and dug into the pocket of his pants. He felt the tell-tale crumpled paper, slightly damp from his earlier ordeal. Hey, I got one too. And it would seem Zero has seen fit to grace us all with a letter. Would you mind terribly reading it to us, young man? His request had been delivered to Junpei, who, after a short moment of surprise, did as he had been asked. On this ship, you will find a handful of doors emblazoned with numbers. We will call these the numbered doors. The doors in front of you are a pair of the same. The key to opening these numbered doors are the numbered bracelets that each of you possess. Should you total the number on your numbered bracelets and find that the digital root of that number equals the number on that door, the door will open. Only those who have opened the door may pass through. There are, however, limits. Only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. All those who enter must leave, and all who enter must contribute. Bracelet. Jube figured had to mean the bulky thing on his wrist. He glanced around, and it looked like everyone else had one as well, and had come much to the same conclusion. The purpose of this game is simple. Leave the ship alive. It is hidden, but an exit can be found. Seek a way out. Seek a door that carries a nine. Junpei had reached the end of the letter. There was a long moment of silence, and then the speaker crackled to life once more. There is one last thing I must tell you. As you have no doubt surmised, this ship has begun to sink. On April 14th, 1912, the famous ocean liner Titanic crashed into an iceberg. After remaining afloat for two hours and forty minutes, it sank beneath the waters of the North Atlantic. I will give you more time. Nine hours. That is the time you will be given to make your escape. The voice finished and the speaker went silent. The sound of a bell tolling echoed through the hall. It came from the dance hall adjacent to the stairwell. It took those assembled on the stairs mere moments to trace the sound to an antique clock embedded into the wall. Seven, eight, nine. Hmm. The sound of the ninth bell faded, and the tenth never came. That meant the time was nine o'clock, most likely nine o'clock in the evening. When Junpei had peered out the window of his cell, he had seen nothing but blackness. It had to be nighttime. If that was the case, then they would need to escape by 6 a.m. the following day. Now it is time. Let our game begin. I wish you all the best of luck. The speaker went silent and did not speak again. Silver yelled at the speaker with language coarse enough to embarrass a sailor, but the rest of Junpei's companions were silent, deep in thought. Junpei, too, was consumed by his thoughts. There was a great deal he didn't understand. Who was Zero? What was the nonary game? Why had he been chosen to make them be part of it? Was he a criminal who took delight in playing with his victims? Or did he have some other purpose? Why had Junpei been chosen to be a part of this insane game? Why had any of them been chosen? But one question was foremost in his mind. Akane. They hadn't seen one another since elementary school. Why had she appeared now? Coincidence? No, that seemed impossible. There had to be a reason. He didn't know what it might be, but 
There had to be a reason. Very well. The lion's voice seemed oddly loud in silence. Standing around here won't do us any good. Best we get moving, don't you think? Get moving? Are you planning to open the numbered doors? Hey, wait. Don't tell me you're actually going to do what this zero says. No, no, that's not what I mean. The lion shook his head, mildly annoyed. I'm saying let's find another way. After all, we haven't really examined this place yet. We... what? Da-da-da. Da-da-da. Their separate investigations finished. All nine people returned to where they'd left one another. The result of their work was nothing. They were completely sealed in. Their hard work had not gone completely to waste, however. They had learned a number of things as they scoured the parts of the ship they could reach. It seemed they were confined to decks A through C. C deck was as far down as they would be able to go, however. The reason being... D deck was completely submerged. Strangely, however, the water had risen no further than D deck. The flow seems to have been stopped somehow, as evidenced by the surface of the water on D deck, which was smooth as glass. The prince knelt, knelt down and gently drew his hand across it. Perhaps this Zero fellow had used some sort of remote control to seal a watertight door lower down. He said that our time limit was nine hours. In other words, this water won't rise for nine hours. Then, you're saying we won't sink till then? Well, that may be a little too optimistic. No point to wishful thinking. There were three metal doors on sea deck. A single door stood off to the side with two more on the wall facing the central staircase. None of them had numbers or verification devices. They were, however, locked like the other doors. No matter how much they pushed and shoved, the doors refused to move. The mountain and the lion threw themselves against them a few times, but to no avail. The door in the back had a keyhole. Just above it was a strange mark in the shape of a circle surrounding a dot. There were two other doors on sea deck as well, but it was clear they were elevators. Each had a button next to it with an upside down triangle. They tried pushing the button. No response. Apparently, there was no power running the elevators. To the left of the elevator doors was a card reader. The card reader also had a strange mark on it. It looked like a lowercase h with a dash across the upper stem of the h. Junpei stared at it for a while. This is the symbol of Saturn. It's a astrological symbol. So then the mark on the other door, I think that one's the sun symbol. They had seen the same symbol on a deck. There was a door on either side of the stairs. One on the left had a keyhole with a similar symbol engraved on it. Uh, this is the Earth symbol. The horizontal line symbolizes the equator, and the vertical one, the prime meridian. Ah, good to know. Junpei looked at the ceiling. There was a great circle cut in it, perhaps for a skylight or a glass dome, but it had been filled with a gargantuan metal plate. The metal looked very solid. Anything short of an explosive charge was unlikely to damage it. There were several windows along both sides of the ship. Or at least, there had been. They too were covered in metal plates. In other words... We're trapped. All exits go nowhere. Junpei was not happy. The girl with pink hair spoke up next. Well, I'm sure they go somewhere. We just can't open them. Then the mountain spoke. You don't know that. For all we know, they just open into walls or take us in circles. Uh, the prince did not agree. No, I'm sure they go somewhere. Otherwise, what would their point be? And we can open them. Well, two of them at least. You mean the numbered doors? All eyes turned towards the doors with the numbers on them. The atmosphere in the room grew tense. Hey, wait a minute. I think I said this earlier, but I don't think we should do that. The dancer moved in front of the doors, as if to block them. 
We'd have to be crazy to open these doors. If we do that, we're doing exactly what Zero wants us to do. Suddenly, everyone began to speak at once. I agree. I don't. That's a terrible idea. We should keep going. We should stay here. We don't have any way to open any of these doors. We should just wait. Someone's bound to come find us. We don't have time for that. In eight and a half hours, the ship is going to sink. The clamor of voices made it next to impossible to determine who was saying what. Their arguments grew more and more intense, and people were shouting and screaming at each other. Junpei had remained silent, but at last he could take no more. Hey! Shut up! They fell silent, and all eyes turned to Junpei. He felt each stare burning into him, but he refused to flinch. Before we try and decide where we're going to go, there's something else we ought to do. Well, what's that? We need to exchange information. We don't know anything about each other. I want to know who you guys are. Who you are, where you came from, why you ended up here. Don't tell me you aren't curious, too. They were silent. Some of them looked the other way or bit their lip or crossed their arms and stared at the ceiling. But one of them spoke up. It was Akane. I agree. I think Jumpy is right. Jumpy? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about him. I just call him Jumpy. His name is Junpei. She pointed towards Junpei. We're childhood friends. Uh, we went to the same elementary school. Wait, stop! Don't tell us stuff we didn't ask you about. Zero's probably watching us right now. What are you going to do if he's listening in, huh? Would that be bad? Hell yeah, it would! We don't know how much that bastard knows about us. Maybe he just picked a bunch of random people to kidnap. If that is the case, then it'd be dangerous for us to let him know too much. If Zero knows who we are, he could go after our families. Maybe he'd tell us he had them to get us to do stuff, you know? But we still need to know what our names are. It's going to be hard to talk to each other if we don't have names. All right, then why don't we have uh, code names? To him, apparently, it seemed like the obvious solution. Code names? Yeah, we'll each pick something. Like, uh, I'll be seven. Seven? Why are you seven? Seemed like a fair question. The mountain stuck out his left arm. Uh, cause this bracelet number says seven. Oh, I get it. Yeah, that's a good idea. He smirked. Well, alright, I'm gonna be Santa. Any of you chumps know Japanese? No, well, San means three. So I'll be Santa. Santa. You know, like Santa Claus. Fits, don't you think? Now, I need you guys to be honest with me. Why the hell does that fit? Okay, anyway. <laughs> I don't I don't know if I think Santa of this guy. Maybe Snow. I could see Snow. But whatever. Not that Snow. Oh, uh, then your bracelet number. Yeah, it's got a three on it. Good job, Grandpa. Look at those armbands as well. Like, he's just got, like, the sleeve. Like, he's rocking the Jeff Hardy look. Anyway. Sorry, distracted. Just like the mountain had done before, Silver thrust out his left hand. Sure enough, the face of his bracelet read, three. Hmm, very well then. I'll go next, shall I? My bracelet number is one. Given that, I think ace seems appropriate. I'll be Lotus then. As I'm sure you all know, a Lotus has eight petals. Which means, of course, that my bracelet number is... Eight. Hmm, I would appreciate it if you call me Snake. My bracelet number is two. Since Ace has chosen cards, then I shall choose Jice. Snake Eyes, clearly. Which is particularly relevant, given that I am blind. Blind? Really? He kept his eyes closed during their entire ordeal, which had suggested something strange, but to hear it said so casually. It was something of a surprise. Everyone seemed a little nervous at the Prince's proclamation but no one seemed to know how to react to it. There was one person, however, who didn't seem to be surprised in the least. The girl with the pink hair. I want to be Clover. You know, like a four-leaf Clover. Good luck, right? Looking almost bored, she held out her left hand. The face of her bracelet showed the number four. They'd come around to Junpei. He held out his bracelet. All right, my number's five, so my code name's gonna be... Why even have one? It's not like there's any point to it now. The dancer cut him off mid-sentence. 
I mean, we all know your name already. You're Junpei. Uh oh. They all nodded. Akane stepped forward nervously. Then you should all call me by my name too. Because, I mean, it doesn't seem. Doesn't seem fair to Jumpy? You're thinking it's not cool for you to hide your name after you told us his? Kane dot dot dots. Kane fidgeted awkwardly. Junpei decided he had to do something. Well, what's your bracelet number? It's six. She hesitated for a moment, then held out her left hand. As she claimed, the bracelet's face showed a six. Junpei looked at it for a moment and thought, All right then, why don't we call you June? June? Yeah, you know, it's the sixth month of the year. So you're June. Jumpy. Kane kneaded her hands and looked up at Junpei, uncertain. She smiled. He smiled back at her, though, reassuringly. Are you good with that? She thought about it for a few more minutes and seemed to come to a decision and gave Junpei a small nod. Their names decided, Junpei ran over them quickly in his head. One was Ace. Two was Snake. Three was Santa. Four was Clover. Five was Junpei's number. Akane was six, and Junpei had given her the code name of June. Seven was seven. What a baller. <laughs> and eight was Lotus. That meant eight of them, including Junpei, had revealed their bracelet numbers. But that still left one person. He was the man with the glasses and the hair like a bird's nest. He hadn't said anything since they met on the stairs, and he didn't look like the sort of person who was inclined to conversation. His skin was pale, his breathing was heavy, and he was soaked with nervous sweat. His behavior seemed very suspicious, or perhaps slow, simply emotionally unstable. Difficult to tell. Whatever the case, it seemed clear that he was only a fingertip's worth of a grip on his sanity. The girl with pink hair, Clover, walked up to him, slowly. She put her hands on her hips and eyed him suspiciously. What number are you? He didn't answer. His bloodshot eyes twitched from person to person, and his breath came in hot pants. Hey, I'm talking to you. The man licked his dry lips with a shaking tongue and spoke with a voice like old paper. <laughs> Isn't it obvious? There are nine people here, and, and do you know the numbers one through eight are? And I'm the only one left. So you're nine? Y yeah He extended a trembling arm. The bracelet did indeed say nine. Clover looked at it contemptuously. What's your code name? C c code name? What do you want us to call you? We all made up names, you should too. I, I don't need one. Well why not? Be because I'm not going to stay here w with you. He took a shuddered breath and exhaled. Clover looked at him with something very like disgust. You've got some sort of plan? I, I do! Yeah, well, what's that? You, sh you sure you want to know? Yeah? Well, all right, then. Let me show you. I'm gonna do this! Ah! By the time they realized it, what he was doing, it was too late to stop him. The man's body moved like a snake's. In the blink of an eye, he had slid around behind her and wrapped his arm around her waist. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? Silver, uh, Santa, leapt forward towards Clover and the Ninth Man. He was halfway there when... Stay, stay back! Suddenly, the man's hand dove into his pocket. Oh, shit. He came back with a knife. A pocket knife. He held it to Clover's pale, quivering neck. If, if you get any closer, I'll cut her open! Santa skidded to a halt. He snarled at the scrawny man with the knife and gritted his teeth. Yes, that's right! The man's smile was neither friendly nor reassuring. Sweat poured down his neck, soaking the collar of his shirt. Clover, are you alright? The prince, uh, Snake's voice, sounded oddly concerned. Y yeah I'm, I'm fine. Her voice shook, making her words even less convincing. What the hell are you trying to do? I told you. This is, this is my plan. What are you going to do to her, you sick son of a bitch? Don't worry. I'm not going to do anything to her. 
If she just does what I tell her to, I'll let her go. He started to move backwards, slowly keeping his grip on Clover. Keeping their distance, Junpei and the others followed. Eventually, the man reached the wall. He gave a start as his back touched it, then glanced around quickly and spoke. Verify! Huh? The left! Look to your left! Do you see the device on the wall? Place your hand on that scanner panel, the, the round part! What if I don't? The man's nostrils flared and he looked as he was about to choke. Are, are you an idiot? What do you think? I could slit your throat right now! I'll kill you if I have to! All I need is your bracelet! Just do it! Do it now! He pressed the knife against Clover's neck, hard. Slowly, she stretched out her left hand towards the device. Her back was to it, so she had to feel around for a moment before she found the circular panel. It made a cold, electronic noise, and on the display above her hand, an asterisk appeared. So that's how it works, Junpei thought to himself. By placing one's palm on what the ninth man called the scanner panel, the user's bracelet number would be entered into the device. Should you total the numbers on your bracelets and find that the digital root of that number equals the number on that door, the door will open. Junpei shifted his eyes to the door itself. The number on it was five. The ninth man seemed to know a little more about the device's operation than he should. How had he known exactly what to do? Good, good, you're done! Next! His bloodshot eyes crept from person to person until finally, he stopped upon the lion, Ace. You, right? You're the one with the number one bracelet, right? Yes, I am. So? Then you're, you're next! Just verify your number on this, like this little brat did! Wh what are you doing? Do it! Don't you care what happens to her? Oh, okay, okay, just calm down. Ace held up his hands, palms out. The ninth man jerked his chin towards the device. Slowly, cautiously, Ace moved towards the device. After what seemed like an agonizing eternity, he reached it. Now verify! Ace nodded and placed his hand on the scanner panel. The device beeped again, and a second asterisk appeared. Now the device had Clover and Ace's numbers. Four and one. Four plus one equals five. The same as the number written on the door. But it wouldn't open just yet. Only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. The door needed at least one more person. Who would that be? G get back! His voice shook, but the knife held to Clover's throat made his words a command. Ace took two, then three steps back. No further! More than that! Go all the way back! Slowly, Ace did what he was told. The night man's lips curled into a cruel, twisted smile. That was when Junpei understood his plan. Clover's four and Ace's one. Added to the night man's nine. Four plus one plus nine equals fourteen. One plus four equals five. In other words... <laughs> <laughs> Thank God you were all so cooperative. Now I can get out of this nightmare. He pressed his hand against the scanner panel. A third asterisk appeared on the screen. He dropped his hand to the lever on the side of the device and pulled. The door opened with a heavy, metallic groan. He let go of Clover. Wait! Jupe leapt towards the night man, but he wasn't fast enough. The man shoved Clover. Ah! And hopped through the door. Okay, have a good one, guys. I'm going off ahead now. Well then, good goodbye. He raised his hand and wave, a twisted smirk on his face. Then he was gone. The door ground shut with a dull clang of metal on metal. Clover, are you all right? Snake ran to Clover's side as she lay on the floor. Yeah, I'm fine. She climbed unsteadily to her feet and once again, once there, leaned heavily on Snake's shoulder for support. Junpei ran to the door. The others followed him. Several pairs of hands grabbed hold of the handles and pulled. 
They grunted and strained, but... Shit! Ah, oh, I won't budge! That was when Lotus the Dancer spoke. Her voice was quiet. Do you hear something? Like what? Like some sort of beeping? Junpei pressed his ear against the cold metal of the door. The others did the same. You're, you're right, I can hear it too. What is it? It's it. Then they heard something else. It was the ninth man. Shit! Why isn't it stopping? God damn it! You, you lied! Lied? This, this wasn't supposed to happen! This is wrong! This is wrong! His voice shook with fear. Safe on the other side, they stepped back from the door and looked at one another. What, what's happening in there? Oh, open the door! Please! I, I'm begging you! Help me! Please get me out of here! Get me out of here! Junpei grabbed hold of the device. He slammed his hand on the scanner panel. Nothing happened. Why didn't it register him? He looked at the display where the asterisk had shown up, and it said, Engaged. Ah! Oh, oh my god! Oh my god! There's, there's no time left! Listen! I was lied to! He lied to me! He put me in here! It was him! He killed me! It was him! Ah! 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 The explosion rocked the room. Instinctively, they ducked. They stood up, slowly, when they realized there was no danger. No one spoke. Silence filled the room. In that silence, the electronic tone that echoed across the room sounded as loud as a gunshot. All eyes turned towards it. It had come from the device mounted next to the door. The display changed from engaged to vacant. L let's see if we can open it. Seven, the mountain swallowed hard. Junpei nodded and placed his hand on the scanner panel. A red asterisk appeared on the LCD panel. The device had registered Junpei's bracelet, number five. His was not enough, however. At least two more people were needed. Junpei asked, oh, who should I ask? Well, who do we want to ask? Let's go with, oh, let's go with Snake and Seven. They seem nice. Uh, Snake, Seven, do you think you could give me a hand here? The pun was a little too on the nose, but the mood was still grim. Both Snake and Seven lifted their left hands silently. Slowly, each of them placed their hand on the scanner panel. 5 plus 2 plus 7 equals 14. 1 plus 4 equals 5. They'd fulfilled the conditions. If they were to pull the lever on the side... Are, are you guys ready? I'm, I'm gonna open it. Junpei grabbed the lever and looked back over his shoulder. They stiffened and nodded. Junpei nodded back and set his mouth in a grim line. Then he slowly lowered the lever. There was a metallic groan and the door slid open. A breath of air drifted out of it, carrying a stench that nearly made them all gag. Junpei grimaced and put a hand over his mouth. Oh my god! Good god! Lotus and Ace shuddered. Seven grunted. Whoa, that's... that's pretty bad. Even Santa's voice shook. He... he blew up! It appeared that Santa was right. The hallway on the other side of the door was splattered with chunks of torn flesh and dark red blood. Ah! The shriek echoed across the room. It had come from June. Then her strength left her and she dropped. As Junpei turned to catch her, the door groaned shut. She crumpled to the floor. And I think that is actually where we're going to leave us for now. Thank you everyone for watching today. This has been Scotty J. Hopefully you enjoyed 999 so far. And we'll have to see what happens to the crew next. Anyway, Scotty J signing off. Bye bye.